I bring you greetings from the city of Memphis. Do you receive them? Yes. Uh, today I want to bring the word of God to you. And uh, my prayer is that the word of God will ignite a spark in your life and in your heart. Amen? Uh, my prayer is that the word of God will bring clarity, give you a clear eye. And I pray that today, as uh, by the time I finish, that the word of God will have encouraged you. That the word of God will have come to you and healed you. That the word of God will have come to you and empowered you. That you will not be the same person again. All of us. That it will have changed us to be better people. To understand the Lord better. So that we can be able to be where the Lord would like us to be. I was listening to, a, 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 there was a, a, a seminar organized by the ladies, and I happened to pass by and I attended. And uh, after the speaker had spoken, I said my, my main takeaway in whatever was spoken was that I need to keep an open mind so that I can continue to learn and grow. And I believe any time we come to church, it uh, doesn't matter how many years we have been coming, we need to keep an open mind because the Lord has always got a new word for us. He got something new for us to help us to be better. Our scripture today, the main scripture we are going to read is from uh, John uh, chapter 1. The gospel according to John chapter 1, verse 19 to 30. Thank you for the preacher's water. Uh, if you can give us the text in the NIV version, then we can read together and uh, discover what the Lord has for us this morning. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? He, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The thongs of, his, of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This all happened in Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you may break the word of life for us. That it may cause a change. That it may help us to move forward in the way that you have desired for us. In Jesus' name. In the text that we read, I just want to pick a few, a few, a few lines and, and I want you to notice that these people who came to John, they had seen him uh, do things. Uh, he had gone into wilderness and called the people and said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they were coming in droves to be baptized. So some of the religious leaders uh, sent out uh, uh, messengers to go and check out uh, who this person was. 
And they came with a word asking, who are you and what would you say about yourself? Many times when uh, we go to a place and they ask you, who are you? Sometimes they, it is meant to dismiss us. Uh, who do you think you are? Uh, or if you do something and then someone asks you, like uh, I was being uh, transported by a young man uh, in the city, and we came to a place where a policeman had stopped a lorry. And uh, this young man was so agitated, the one who was driving me, he, st he stopped and asked the policeman, why are you disturbing the Wananchi? And, and the policeman got surprised. Who is this? Who is daring to, to challenge me? And uh, the policeman uh, kind of gathered his, himself again and he said, Jeepa Shuguri. <laughs> so sometimes people ask, who are you? I, I mean, sometimes it's none of your business. But here these people are not actually being negative. They were actually wanting to know who John was so that they can give him the due respect, so that they can work with him uh, and, uh, uh, in whatever he was doing. And this, I believe, is a question coming to you and to me. People are asking, who are you? And what would you say about yourself? They are not asking because they have anything negative about you. But they want to know who you are and what you stand for. What would you say about yourself? It is very important for you to very quickly tell people who you are and what you stand for. I'll give you an example of this compound here. If we swept this building and threw the trash in a particular place, you don't have to tell anybody. All the people in the trash will go and put it on top of that heap. To give you our example, you have seen how people use um, uh, outside places like uh, outside the uh, restrooms. One person starts using a particular corner as a restroom and everybody follows. It's called the broken window theory. It came from an idea that if you have an old building, and you have one broken window, if you don't repair it, when the youths are going around, they will break all the other windows. Because they think it's a, a, a house where people should break windows. The way it is presented. But if you see one in an old building, uh, one window is broken and you repair it, then everybody respects the building and they're not going to break any of the windows. That's why people are asking, who are you? If your windows are broken, you find they are going to start breaking uh, your life. And they are they're actually giving you a chance asking you, what would you say about yourself? The sooner you know your identity, because your identity helps also to define your mission and purpose. Because you see, John, they ask you, are you the Messiah? He said, no, I'm not. Because if he had said he's the Messiah, or he got confused, and he thought he was the Messiah, then he would not have discovered who he is and therefore he would not have been able to finish his mission. But he said, my work is to come before the Christ and prepare his way. And it was so clear that this man did not even go looking for food. He actually was eating wild honey and locusts. He didn't have the time. He was so focused on his mission. He so much knew who he was that he did not allow any distractions in his life. And this is the message that the Lord has for us today. Who are you? And what would you say about yourself? Because if you do not tell us who you are, we are going to assume. If they, people find a building that's, that's got a broken windows, they will not even ask whose building it is. They will start breaking the windows because it's like it belongs to nobody. If you throw trash in a particular heap here in this compound, you see people throwing it because you have told them that's where the trash is supposed to be thrown. We know this because you, you might have heard of somebody who is described as immoral. People can read it off their face. Every man will be chasing them because it is known they are easy going. They are easy to catch. 
Who are you? And what do you stand for? What can you say about yourself? Because people are not negative. They just want to know. If you want to be respected, you have to show people that you are respectable. Who are you and what would you say about yourself? I think that's good that people allow us to define ourselves before they define us. Because if you do not, we are going to say all kinds of things and put labels on you. But if you tell us, you find most people will be respectful enough and they will regard you the way you say yourself. Many times in school, at work, at home, when we tell the people we are saved, they treat us that way. Even when they are talking, when we are around, they change their speech. There are things they will not ask us to do because we have said who we are and what we stand for. Most of the people who get compromised are the ones who have not disclosed who they are and what they stand for. They think you are free to do anything. You think you are welcome to do anything. They don't know your limits. Because sometimes you are sipping soda and sometimes you are sipping a little wine. I know it's become fashionable. I was speaking to one pastor in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. He had come from a very conservative, uh, conservative uh, part of the Baptist church. And he transferred to an, a church in a very affluent area. Affluent as in uh, where the rich people live. The rich Christians and other people. And he told us one of the surprising things he found that it was very fashionable to find people taking wine in, the, in that particular community, even if they say they are saved. So he, got kind of, he was kind of dis, disclosing this to us, and he was wondering. Uh, I, I know also it has become fashionable here in, in Kenya, where they say, uh, and then there will be kawain. And, I, and that is not my topic today. I, I just give it as an example. But if you have told people that you don't take kawain, they, they know. But if you don't tell them, they will actually offer you. And, and they, they don't mean any offense. It's just because they don't know. So you have to define yourself. I'm not uh, um, here talking about uh, uh, trying to be negative about people who take wine. No, that's not what I'm here. I'm just saying, who are you? If you tell me you take wine, I'll, I'll take that's what you are. If you tell me you don't, then I take you that's what you are. That's why the Bible is asking you, who are you? And what will you say about yourself? Because as soon as you disclose this, it is clear both to you. Why it is important is because as soon as you declare who you are by yourself, that's a declaration to yourself. You are clear in your mind, this is who I am, and then you draw the limits. You draw the, 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 the lines beyond which you don't cross. Even when you are alone, if they posted you in Marsabit, and someone who don't know, he doesn't know you there, comes to you and tells you something. You tell him, no, I don't cross that line. I saw someone, I was sitting in a hotel, and I saw a neighbor who worked for the Ministry of Education. Someone was trying to bribe her or something like that. It was a table across in a restaurant. Someone is giving her an envelope, and she's returning it. Someone is giving her an envelope, and she's returning it. You might be in Marisabet where nobody knows you. And someone is giving you an envelope, will you return it? Who are you? And what would you say about yourself? Because as soon as you disclose to people, then people will know how to treat you. It is good for you and for me to know what we stand for. Because it will help us to connect with those activities that help to build that which we consider to be our calling and our mission. The Bible says in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, clarify, make sure you are calling and you are choosing. Make sure, make certain. 2 Peter 1, 10 to 11, make sure you are calling and you are choosing so that you can align your life with, which, with that which you consider 
to be in line with your calling. So that you can select those activities that helps you to build on what is your purpose. So that you can select those people who will help you to connect with your purpose. The Bible tells us in Psalms 1, blessed is the man who chooses the kind of company he keeps. Because that person has to, chosen to hang out with the people. He's like a tree planted by the waters. Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not always hang out with people who, are, who believe in some things which are contrary to what he believes. People who are going different places. But he's choosing those people who are going the same direction. And here I'm not saying that your friends should only be Christians. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. Our people of who are who some people who never even go to church. Even people of other faiths are friends. So I'm not saying you should not have friends in other, other, other people. But if you, most of the time you're hanging out with people who actually are opposed to your faith, very soon uh, you will find they don't even have to do much. It will rub on on you. Blessed is the man who chooses the kind of people and connections that will help you to achieve and to go into the mission and the purpose for which God has called you. Who are you and what would you say about yourself? The sooner you are able to answer those two questions, who are you? You identify yourself and then disclose to us your mission. That helps you to choose. If you know who you are, then it helps you to choose. So it's good for you. You answer that question even before anybody else, it's good for you. You know who you are and what it is. And I believe the first thing you want to know is, I'm a child of God. And then you ask yourself, what would Jesus do in this situation? Number two, if you answer that question, who you are and then speak it to us about yourself. Tell us what it is. Then we all are waiting so that we can help you achieve that goal. You'll be surprised how many people would help you if you disclose what you want to do. Even if you just told me when we are taking tea, I'm thinking of building a house. My mind will come out quickly and start, I'll start thinking about stones and cement and everything. And I'll tell you where you can buy cheap cement. And I'll tell you where you can get good stones. You see, just by speaking out and saying who you are and what you want to do, you already get resources around up. You always get people coming to help you and coming to your aid. It helps us to know what to help you. Because if you don't tell me you want to build, I'll start selling you shambas. But if you tell me, oh, I've already got a plot, I'll stop selling you the plot. But if you don't tell me, I'll start selling you things which you, are, you, are not, you have no interest in. But as soon as you tell me, then I stop. And I start talking to you to ask whatever it is that you want to achieve. It is both in the spiritual and also in the natural. That as we decree, as we declare, as we proclaim, our minds started to follow what it is that we have proclaimed and decreed. And other people actually start to follow. Because everyone is cheering for us. They want us to achieve our dream. You'd be surprised most people are positive. Did you believe that all people are negative? Many people are actually positive. If you tell them what you want to do, you find actually more people will be coming to try and help you that, more than you need. I was somewhere and we were going to get out of that city. I was in Kisumu yesterday. And uh, after we finished what we were doing, there is one lady who had flown together with us. And then we saw her. We didn't know her. We said, ah, we are going back now. Can you ride with us? We already offered her transport. We didn't even know whether she had transport. So, so sometimes if you don't disclose, but she told us, no, no, I, I'm going with that uh, lady. So sometimes if you don't disclose, people will start even, uh, I wanted to say that most people are actually positive. It's a person we met for the first time and we were willing to offer the, the person a ride back to the airport. So people are actually positive. And as soon as you say what you want to do, what your dream is, they are willing to help you. It helps you focus. 
so that you do not lose time. We live in an age of information overload. We live in, a, in, in an age of fake information. We live in an age where there are many callings and distractions. And the sooner you are clear in your mind what it is that you want to, to do, the sooner you will save a lot of your time and energy and effort. And we see John, as I said, was so focused. He did not even have time to be distracted, to look for food. If you don't, then people will define you. If you do not know, if you do not declare what you stand for, then every wind of doctrine in this city will carry you. You hear there is a preacher here, then you go listen. Because you don't know, you are actually looking for an answer. You are a person, you become a perpetual seeker. A person who keeps seeking and never finds. And Jesus said, seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. If you are a perpetual seeker, every new doctrine in this city can pull you, then you need to ask yourself, who am I? And have I declared who I am? Because that helps you to decide. I know who I am. I don't need a new word. I attended a city where there was a preacher invited from London. And most of people were were there and he would call people and give them a word. Now, understand me, I am not against that. I'm not against that, okay? So if a preacher comes here, the bishop invites a pastor and he calls you and gives you a word. I'm not against that and I'm not saying it's true. But don't go looking for a new word. You can receive a word right now. I'm not going to call you. But you can receive a word. What I'm giving you is actually a word. You don't need to need another new word. But if someone comes and prays for you and gives you a word, I'm not against that, okay? Let's understand one another so that you don't think I'm also teaching a new doctrine. No, I'm not. But don't go looking for a new word. Receive the word even when you are in your house. Receive the word of God even when you are at work. Because God will speak to you. Someone will give you an envelope and you return it. That's a word from God. God has said you don't take a bribe. You don't need another pastor to come and tell you, no, don't take a bribe. I mean, God is speaking right to you because you are being tempted at that time. You don't know whether to keep the envelope or to send it back. And you need a word right there. You don't have the bishop. You don't have the pastor. You need a word from God to strengthen you and say, no, I know I have some bills to pay, but I'm not going to take this money. That's when you need the word, not when the pastor is praying for you. Make your calling and choosing sure so that you can be able to do your mission and purpose that God has called you. Are you clear what you should be engaged in right now? Ask God to help you to know what you need to cut off and to know what to add on. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. Je John was clear who Jesus was. He said that the one who is in your midst, I am not even worthy to touch the, to untie his sandals. The laces of his sandals are not worthy. And looking at just immediately thereafter, Jesus appears, and John, looking at him, says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We are in the Easter season, or what the traditional church calls Lent. And that's why I chose this message. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our focus should always 
been on the work and the mission that Christ came to do. And John was pointing to that. He said, I am not the one, but I'm one sent to clear the way of the Lord. You see, when you are in your mission and calling, it is not the longevity of your life or how much you do. Remember, John was killed just around the time when Jesus started his ministry. You'd say, Jesus actually said John was one of the greatest men. And yet he completed his mission in 30 years. You'd have thought maybe he should have been given 100 years. The Bible says, when David had completed his purpose in his generation, then he died. So it is not the longevity of your life. Yesterday, I went to bury someone who was around 60. A person whom we thought has died too young with many gifts in community development, with many gifts who has helped many people. And maybe we had the same feeling, oh, this person has gone too young. I did not want to say those who are close to him, and it might be rude, actually, to go and tell him she had completed her purpose, that's why she died. That might not be the right time. But in truth, you can finish your mission and your purpose in 60 years. You have raised your children. They are standing on their own. You have done the community work that God gave you. And now God is ready to call you because you have finished your mission. And he finds that if you live longer, it's going to damage you. Or you're already so damaged that maybe he needs to harvest you. Finding purpose in God by knowing who you are and you decreeing who you are. You see, by decreeing is actually you are saying I have found or have impressions in my heart that this is what God is calling me to do. It could be in your regular work or even some of the work you do in the church. You can go to the pastor and tell him, I feel the impression that one God wants me to serve in this ministry, in this particular area in the church. That way you are defining who you are and you speak out. It's rather, it's, it's better if you spoke out and then the pastors correct you, but not to speak out at all. You go and tell them, I want to preach next Sunday. It's better to ask them like that. They might tell you, no, not this time. Or they might give you a chance to speak in another one of the other smaller meetings. But it's good you, you already spoke, isn't it? Let them deal with it. You have spoken. Tell them I want now to be one of the people who are singing. They say, hey, let's, let's audition your voice. You speak. Let them check your voice, okay? Don't be afraid. If, if they find your voice needs training, they will train you. They will do what they call voice training. But if you don't have passion, even if you have voice, it's nothing. Passion is what matters. If you have passion, the people who lead, they will, they will take you and, and train you. Who are you? And what would you say about yourself? John was clear who Jesus was and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are you clear about who Christ is? Because that's the beginning of purpose. Because you cannot know, know yourself unless you know where you come from. Until you know who you are connected to. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Why would he refer to Jesus as the Lamb of God? He was reading from the Old Testament. Where people offered animals. And they were killed. If there was a sin in your life, you brought an animal and it was killed. Who do you think should have been killed? The animal was being killed on behalf of you. And the high priest would carry this blood to, and go into the inner chamber of the temple to a place called the Holy of Holies. And he would lay this blood on the mercy table 
so that God would have mercy on you and forgive you. It is serious business with God, with sin. He says you have to pay with your life. And that's why he gave Jesus so that he may, his life might be taken for you and for me so that you do not have to give your life for your sins. It is zero tolerance with God. And yet, because of his life, he provides a way for us. You cannot be able to pay for your sin, but it has been paid for. So you as is only to repent of your sins, that you may receive a forgiveness of your sins and receive the one who came to pay the price. The Bible says there is only one mediator between man and God, the man Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the truth, the, the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes but to me, to God, except through me. That's how we find our identity. When you start asking, who am I? That's when you start discovering, even as John found, he said, I'm not the Messiah, but there is one. It is when you start asking yourself, who am I? You realize you have no identity outside of God. It is one wise man who said, in the heart of every person, there is a vacuum which cannot be filled by anything else but by the person of God in the, but by, the, by God in the person of Jesus Christ. It is when we start asking the question of our identity that we actually come back to God. It is then when we, like this young man who had gone away and had wasted his life, when he came to himself, and asked, who am I? He remembered his father. He remembered his home. It is when you ask the hard question, who am I? And what am I doing here? That's when actually you start getting back to God. You realize you are in a bad place. And you realize there's a better place. Which God has prepared to you. He said, I will arise. I will arise and go back home. And I want to say to those who have not committed their lives to Christ... Giving your life to Christ is just saying, I will arise and go back home. Many people are afraid of getting saved. Are you afraid of going back home to Moranga after spending all the money in Mombasa? For most people, you will go and hope against hope that their parents will receive you back. And most parents will receive you back. Being saved is just saying, I will rise and go back home. I'm in a bad place, but I want to go back to where I belong. So I want to encourage those who are afraid or who, 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 who see it as a mystical thing. It's just going back home. Saying, I will go back home. Going back to where you need to be. Because it is at that place that you actually start knowing, whom am I? Because as soon as you know you are a child of God, then you start drawing limits Boundaries around your life. Boundaries that help you to make the connections, to make the activities that actually build your natural life and your spiritual life. I always give a, an example of a, a guy who was a young man at the same time as me. His work was to sell charcoal. Have you ever seen charcoal? Most of you have never cooked with charcoal. Anybody who has cooked with charcoal? Oh, you still do? Oh, okay, sorry. I, I, I was going to dismiss Chaco. Chaco is still uh, big. So this man was selling Chaco, and you know if you sell Chaco, I don't know that it happens these days, it actually used to rub off on your, on your face. You actually became blacker. By selling Chaco, actually, you became blacker. For some reason, it, 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 the dust actually settled on your skin. You became darker. But this young man, when he got saved, he actually was able to remove the, 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 the for some reason, I think he, he was showering more times. So salvation actually comes and even starts to show on the outside. It even shows on the outside. It cleans the inside and it cleans the outside. Amen? Isn't is that something to admire? That's the beauty of salvation. That's the beauty of salvation, going back home to God. I want to encourage those who have been afraid. Who have said, oh, I'm afraid if I get saved, I will backslide again. No, you don't know. 
Until you do it, you can't say what will happen. First I'll do it and then we see what happens. Don't say, I'm afraid if I get saved, I will backside. How do you know? You don't know. Just, just come. Give your life to Jesus and then we see. If we see you are backsliding, we'll help you. If you tell us, then we'll help you. Who are you and what do you want to become? Can you tell us? As soon as you're clear in your mind about those questions, you find things starting to line up. You find things start to line up. People will actually, you wonder why were people not helping me? They will all start telling you how, where you can find help. Whatever it is, just go and tell people, I've been thinking of going to London to study there. That is if that has, is what is in your heart. If you'll be surprised, they will tell you, I have a cousin there who can actually send you the papers for application. You'll be surprised. So your help is in finding your identity so that you can discover your mission. And then when you speak it out, when you declare, when you declare, when you proclaim, then things start to line up. God starts sending destiny connectors. And then you are able to meet your purpose. That's why people are saying, tell us. Because there are people who have been asking us. They are sent to John and ask, people have been asking, who are you? And can you tell us yourself, rather than people telling us? Because some people are saying, this is Elijah. They were saying, this is the prophet. They said, no, we don't want to hear what people are saying. We want to hear from you. And people are waiting to hear from you. So that God can align you with you, the blessings that is God for you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word which you have spoken to us this morning. Where you are calling us to be clear in our minds what our identity is. Because it is by discovering what our identity is. Or asking ourselves who we are. That we find we cannot find our true identity except coming to you. And from their end, their own, you help us to declare what our purpose is. And everything that has relates to that purpose will be connected to us. I pray that, Lord, you may continue to break this word in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. That it may cause a spark in each one of us. That we will never be the same again. But as we leave this place, we will speak out. That we will seek to answer that question even for ourselves. Who we are and what we want to become. So that we will not be carried by every wind of doctrine. So that we will not go around looking for a word, but we shall hear your word. I want to pray for you if you've never given your life to Christ. As we continue in prayer, I want to give you a chance. You're saying, I will go back home. Or maybe you have become lukewarm. You, you are not sure whether you're cold or hot. I want to give a chance and pray with you. If you show me by the raising of your hand, I will pray with you. If you say, I will go back home to my father. You are saying where I am is not the right place I should be. But I will go back home to my father. I want to return to God. So that I can find whom I am by connecting with God. Maybe you have gone far from God. Or are there things which are separating you from God? The Bible tells us that Peter followed Jesus from afar. And because of so doing, he ended up denying him. Are there things that have kept you afar? You are following Jesus, but from afar. You would like me to include you in this prayer. Keep your hand up. I also ask you to raise your hand if you have a need, a particular issue that you want God to intervene, to intervene in, a door that you want God to open. Or you are saying, Lord, help me. 
to be able to answer that question for myself. Who am I? Where do I, what do I want to become? Where am I going? That I can be able to speak for myself. If you need God to help you to have that clarity, keep your hand up as well. Now, Lord, I want to pray for those who are raising their hands. They are indicating from their own hearts what it is that they would like you to do for them. I pray that you may meet each person who has raised their hands at the point of need. Those who are seeking clarity, direction. Who's, those who are asking, where am I and where should I be going? What am I doing with my life? What should I cut off and what should I add to my life? So that I can reach the purpose for which God has called me. I pray that you may answer to each person. May they receive a word from the Lord. Not from a man. May they hear from God. The one who speaks with a still voice, small voice. The one who is able to speak in our own languages. The one who is able to speak to us even in a language which cannot be understood by men. I pray that he may speak to you and tell you what it is you need to do. Who it is you need to go and speak to. I pray that God will give you courage to decree and to declare, to proclaim who you are, a child of God. To decree and declare the limits, the boundaries around your life. I pray that God will give you the courage because it is out of that courage you will see blessings flow. That blessings will flow as people know who, who you are. So that they can hear the voice of God telling you them what to deliver to you. I pray for healings for those who are sitting in this, under this roof. I pray that the healing of God may touch all of us to heal us from every affliction, from every illness, from every oppression, that the power of God shall break every yoke. That the power of God shall remove every confusion. That our inner eyes might be opened to see what God is telling us and to hear his voice. Lord, as we sit in this congregation, Lord, we do not only represent ourselves. We are a royal priesthood. So we come to represent even our families. We come to represent our loved ones. And we pray, Lord, even as you blessed us this morning, that this same blessing might be extended to our loved ones. Yes, we stand at the altar as representatives of our sick relatives out in the village. Mention their names. Of our loved ones scattered across this country and elsewhere who are facing great challenges. Mention them by their names. We pray that God we will not enjoy your presence and your blessing alone. But we stand as priests at your altar representing our loved ones. Because our joy is if you may touch them. Our joy is if you may, be, may heal them. Our joy is if you may deliver them. And we thank you because you know no distance. Send your word and heal them. Send your word and deliver them. Send your word and meet them at the point of need. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a mighty clap of applause.